Good morning. It's so good to be with you this morning. We are City Bible Church at Home. And we are this morning going to be looking into God's Word in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So if you would be so kind as to join me there, let me begin by opening in prayer. Father, we come into your presence and we know in full assurance of faith, Lord, that you've invited us. You ask us to come and we petition you, Lord. We, we ask that you would take your word this morning and bring it to our hearts. Father, it's our desire that we would be conformed to the image of our Savior. Lord, would you use your word? Would you speak to our hearts? We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, we've been looking uh, for the last couple of weeks at the topic, the subject of prayer. Today I want to talk to you about how I pray for myself. You know, one of the most unusual things that I've heard about the Second World War occurred when the Allied forces dropped in on all those tiny little islands in the South Pacific. They were kind of between Australia and Indonesia. And there's just a myriad of these islands. And so all of these, these allied forces would come in and they would parachute in on the islands and they would build service uh, um, uh, centers of depot um, to service the uh, forces that were engaged in that area. And um, the thing about it is that these natives on these islands had never seen westerners before they knew nothing of the western culture and so when they heard a plane go overhead and looked up in the skies they would see men dropping out of the heavens and because of that they thought they were gods and so they really left the natives on the island awestruck to see all of these things. They'd never seen a, a, a jeep before. They'd never seen a parachute, of course. They never saw food in a can before. But the most amazing thing to them was Zippo lighters. They were the most amazing because at the very flick of a finger, you could have fire. So the natives began to pray to these men they called them Tom Navy, and they would pray. And then when these guys got back in the plains and left, the natives thought God had left them. Well, years later, missionaries went and, and went to the islands and, and tried to convert the natives, but they weren't interested in having their souls redeemed. What they wanted was more Zippo lighters. You know, we think that's odd, don't we? But um, they became known as the cargo cults. And we think it's odd, but the fact is, in a whole lot of evangelical churches in our day, we're not too far from that because we believe that, that in so many people's minds, if we just ask God for something, he's going to drop it into our laps. Remember Jim Baker? He was the head of PTL. He was really the very first guy to make prosperity gospel teaching popular. Now listen to what he said in his book, I Was Wrong. The name says it all. He said, for years I embraced and espoused the gospel that some skeptics had branded as prosperity gospel. I didn't mind the label at all. In fact, I was proud of it. I even got to the point where I was teaching people, don't pray God, your will be done when you're praying for health and wealth because you already know that's God's will. However, the more I studied the Bible while in prison, I had to admit that the prosperity message did not line up with the tenure of Scripture. Isn't that interesting? You know, I, I wonder how many people in the North American evangelical church today pray that same way. God, God, this is what I want. Would you just drop it into my lap? Well, today I want to talk to you about prayer. We're going to look at 2 Thessalonians. And Paul tells us, you know, 
this is how I'm praying for you. And I think that from this prayer, we can understand how we're to pray for ourselves. You know, so many people, so many people are confused about how we're supposed to pray. What am I supposed to say? You know, exactly when it comes to prayer, how do I pray? Well, I believe, folks, very emphatically that our prayer life can and will elevate our spiritual life. The fact is the Lord is more interested in us rising to another spiritual level than anything else. He wants us conformed to, to the image of his son. That's the goal of it all. That's the point of application of the word to our lives to conform us. It's his word changing us, conforming us to the image of his son. And so the, I believe that the, the, the time that, that we spend in prayer hearing from God and praying to God can and will elevate our spiritual life. So as we have been talking in, in, on Wednesday nights about hearing from God, I think that, that that's as, as important or maybe even more important than us verbalizing prayer. We need to be listening to what God is saying. Yet if I got up in front of people and bowed my head and invited you to join me in prayer, if I was silent for 10 seconds, I'm sure you'd be wondering, is he okay? Did he nod off? Where, where, where is he? Because it's not our habit. But the fact is, when we come to the Lord in prayer, listening is as much or more important than 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 saying, than speaking. But that's that's a reality. Uh, a part of prayer is to know the will of God, to pray and ask for his will. Thy will be done. Prayer is learning to, to think God's thoughts after him. Prayer is learning to desire those things that God desires. Prayer is learning to love what God loves. Prayer is learning to hate what God hates. And it's also learning to long for the things that God longs for. So the more I look at prayer, the more time I spend studying prayer, you know, I, 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 I come to realize that if we stay less self-centered in our prayer life, and more centered on him. If we stay focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, then we end up praying less and less about our wants and about our personal needs. We pray less and less on all of that. And we really pick up on thy will be done, thy kingdom come. That's what we really want to grow in. You see, we need to understand how do I come before God? Because so much of, of, of our prayer life is, God, I want this or I want that or heal this or heal that. or and, and listen, listen, that's important to God too. It is, but it's every bit as important to hear what he would have us pray about as well. And so as we look at this this morning, this passage in Thessalonians, we need to understand something. First of all, the the church in Thessalonica was, was under some heretical teaching. They, they were being led astray by some heresy that was being taught to them about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so as they, they, they were going through that, they were also going through horrific persecution in the church. We find in the first chapter that Paul talks about the fact that God is going to come again. He's coming again and he's coming again in power and in glory. And he's going to deliver you out of that persecution. He's going to bring judgment on all those who have rejected him. And that's what he says in chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians. And uh, just before he gives this great explanation of what's going to happen at the second coming in verse 11 and 12 he prays for them let me read the passage 
verse 11 says, Therefore we also pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the first thing we see in this prayer is that we should pray for personal maturity. He wants us to be praying for, uh, for ourselves that we grow spiritually in Christ. Look at verse 11 again. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. That is so vital. Um, what does he mean when he says this calling? Well, we see that in a number of places in, in the New Testament. Over in Romans chapter 8, we see that we are predestined. And those who he predestined, he called. And, and those he called, he justified. See, that calling is talking about salvation. And listen, if you have responded to that call, then you have responded to the greatest need in your life. That is God's gift to you and I. And if you've not responded to that, I pray that before I'm finished today, you will know the wisdom in coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and making him Lord of your life. The Bible says, to as many as believed on him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God. You see, I say all of that to say this. That isn't the call Paul is talking about here in Thessalonians. What he's talking about here is the way we live our Christian life, the way we put flesh on our Christian life. He's talking about how we flesh out our Christian life. In other words, you live your life in a way so that when God looks at you, he sees that you're worthy of the fact that Jesus hung on the cross and died for you. Now, you can't earn salvation. I'm not talking about you earning your salvation. You can't. You can't. You're not worthy of it, folks. None of us are. None of us. But through that shed blood, because of that blood, that blood covers us. It wraps us in Christ's righteousness so that when we live out the Christian life, we're, we're, we're to be living a life worthy of that calling. Now I want to take you back to Ephesians chapter 4, first of all. Ephesians chapter 4. And look at what he says. You see, this isn't some passing fancy for Paul. It's not something he's just fallen into here. He says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. He makes it very clear. He's saying, act like a Christian, walk like a Christian, talk like a Christian. And and what all does that involve? Well, he says it in verse two, he says, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Have you done that this week? Have you walked worthy of your calling? Have you been, been gentle and caring with other people or or have you reacted and, and, and responded irrationally to them. He's saying, walk worthy of your calling. Now, look over at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. He says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you. I may hear of your affairs, I'm sorry, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith 
of the gospel. He's saying that we are to walk worthy of our calling by standing together, by being united, by having one mind, being together in one spirit, not by saying that we, we fear what the future's gonna hold. You know, all these people were caught up in, in this second coming heresy that was being taught, and they were, they were in fear you know, we, we don't need to fear what the world's going to do. We need to focus on Christ. It, that, if we are focused on Christ and know that he is our sovereign God, it doesn't matter how much, you know, the pandemic happens or how much the world collapses around us. Now, is that enough? No? Okay, let me show you another one. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1. Colop Colossians chapter 1. Because we see it again and again in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. Um, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10. It says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. It's again and again and again. How am I to do that? By pleasing him. By, by walking worthy of this name that I carry as Christian. You see, if we work on pleasing him, if, if we really focus on that, then that relationship is right, then all of this has a way of falling into place for us. All of it. Look at verse 11. He says, strengthened by all might, according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Man alive, that's good stuff. That's how you do it. Now, let me give you another one over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And uh, Paul is going to say here that, that, um, well, look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. I mean, don't you just love it when the word of God stacks on itself like that? It just stacks up on itself. Um, he says, where are we here? Um, verse 12. Yes, verse 12. Thank you. Um, chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 and verse 12. I got it, I got it. That you walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And, and how does he explain it? Go back to verse 10. He says, you are witnesses in God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. He lays it out for us. We don't have to guess. But the question is, are we walking worthy of his calling? Are we walking worthy of his calling? And we're going to go back to our passage here. But he says, when you go to pray, when you go to pray, this is how you should be praying. Not that, that God should give you all this stuff and bring you more Zippo lighters. Not that he should just pour into your lap anything you ask him for but that God would grow you up spiritually, that you walk worthy of the calling, that you mature spiritually so that that, that walk is truly worthy of that calling. Not, not, Lord, give me cushy things so I can make my life more comfortable. And I gotta tell you, at this age, and I know I look younger than my age, but at this age, I gotta tell you, I like to be comfortable. I like it when I can can be in comfort. You know, these old bones need a little bit of comfort to 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 be able to exist. I think, but 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 I don't pray God give me more comfort. If I did, my prayer life would be way off base. But now let me give you the second thing here because I'm just going to give it to you quick because I really want to get to the third point. And the second point is this, I need to pray for divine fulfillment in my life. Divine fulfillment. So go back with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. It says, therefore, we also pray always 
for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. Okay, that's point one. We need to mature, be, be maturing spiritually so that we're worthy of that calling. And he says, to fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. To fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. Now, it means to accomplish, to bring about, to, to fulfill every desire for goodness. So every desire that I have in my life personally lines up with what God wants for my life as well. Lord, Lord, I pray that you would bring that about, that you, that you would make my desires to be your desires, you know? And, and we wonder, how can I pray so that God's will is answered in my life? How can I pray so that God will answer those prayers in my life? All I have to do is pray according to his will, right? Because if I'm praying according to his will, it's going to happen. That is how we pray, according to his will. And we can, when we do that, we can demand as our due what we're praying for. Excuse me. <coughs> we can demand as our due. You know, it really is an exercise where, where we can be transformed as we're praying for God's will in my life. I can be transformed to the place where God's will becomes my will. And that's how he says that we're supposed to pray. And that's the second point. And I could, I could say a whole lot more about that than I'm going to, but I want to press on. I want to get to the third thing. And the third thing is this. And we need to go back to verse 11 here in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And the third thing is, I am to pray for my spiritual empowerment. I'm to ask God to empower me spiritually. Look at verse 11 again. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. That's point number one. Secondly, fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. Point number two. And thirdly, the work of faith with power. Now, I could really take off on that work of faith. James talks about uh, about he says faith without works is dead and we're not talking about working for your salvation but out of your faith it's an automatic response to do things as unto the lord now over in uh, first thessalonians chapter one and verse two we see that these thessalonians had a real work of faith first thessalonians chapter one and verse 2 says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing, look at this, your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. He says it's there. That work of faith is there. It was real faith. Because, as I said, according to James, faith without works is dead. And, and, and you know, we come to church and we sing about pray, faith. We pray about faith. We talk about faith. We, 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 we really, you know, center in on faith. But the question is, you know, could, could someone come here and, 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 and see our work of faith? Could, could they see our faith so strong in us that it's exploding? You know, would they see that? Where, where, where is our work that, that is, you know, um, requires a faith and a total dependence on God? We need to pray that the power of God would so work in our lives that there would be an explosion of faith in accomplishing whatever it is that Jesus Christ wants us to accomplish. Now, that word power, by the way, is the word dunamis, where we get the word dynamite from. And you know what? You don't have to work at, 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 at having dynamite explode. It's inerrant. Dynamite is going to explode. And so when we pray, God, make our work of faith powerful, according to to Second Thessalonians chapter two or chapter one, when we pray, make it powerful, as he calls us to in, in verse eleven, 
then we are praying his will. That power is inherent because the spirit of God is in us. It's in us. And so that power is there. What we need to do is, is bring it forth, bring it out in our faith. And that's what he's saying, that this spirit of God be in this work that we do by faith. It is totally dependent on God. Now, why would we do that? Well, let's go back to our passage and look at verse 12. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 12. That the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in you and you and him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that's good stuff. Everything we do as a church, as a people, is to lift up Jesus Christ. He says, if I, if I be lifted up, we'll draw all people to me. Not City Bible Church. We don't need to lift up City Bible Church. If we are about what he's called us to be, he's called us that this house be a house of prayer. If we are a people of prayer, a people who are praying in faith, believing, that's going to draw people because they're going to see the power. They're going to see that work of faith in our lives. And then, then when we pray, pray for yourself individually and pray for the church. First of all, God, help us grow spiritually. Help us mature spiritually. And then, God, bring about your will in our lives. Make your will my will. And, and, and fulfill our desires, you know, that, that that desire of our heart be the will of God for the church and for our lives personally. And then finally, Lord, help us have that work of faith that is so, so evident because the power of God is there. You see, we are to pray for God's explosive power in our lives. And in the midst of a problem, in the midst of a dilemma, when you get that report from the doctor, when, when, when you're going through a tough time financially, spiritually, physically, listen, you know, you have the faith to understand that God has not left you. God is right there with you. You know, I, I got to tell you, I have had a diagnosis of cancer three times in my life. I, I've, been, I've had two throat surgeries and radiation. I've had more needles and cut open more time. I'm sorry, but, but I have had surgeries for cancer. I've had it three times. My wife, my beautiful beloved wife, was told she would not be leaving the hospital when we were in BC due to a blood disorder that she had. It, it, was, it was bad. I mean, she was bleeding through her pores. It was so, so, so bad. And yet God never left us, never left us. And I believe that we can can you know there there's we need to understand that we can glorify God in anything sickness is certainly an opportunity to see the the power of God you know the bible talks about about a sickness unto death a sickness unto discipline and a sickness unto the glory of God and i'm of a mind that it doesn't matter which one of those we go through. God can still be glorified. If it's a sickness unto discipline, if we've done something that God has allowed discipline in our lives, we need to be a quick learner. We need to learn the lesson quick and give God the glory. And we can either become better or we can become bitter. But if we become better, we give God the glory. We're not in that season as long as you might think. And then... Even in death, and folks, I have been at the bedside of many people who were stepping from the, the, the darkness of this life into the glory of heaven. And I'll tell you what, in, those, in, in a whole lot of those who were believers, I have seen God glorified time and again so that their families around them, their loved ones who were not believers, knew that they were at peace because they were entering into his presence. So that when that sickness of death does happen, it's all about him. It's all about him. 
Listen, we have that opportunity to walk worthy of his calling. You know, we have no idea what the future is, but we know who holds the future. Let's let's close in prayer. And as, as we do, I want you to understand we have a calling to salvation. We have a calling that we pray that, that our walk is worthy of that name Christian that we carry. We have a calling to pray for fulfillment of, of, of our desires in our life to match up with the desires that the Lord has for our life. And we have a calling to pray for the Lord to be glorified in your life and in my life. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it stacks up over and over again with so many of these truths and, and with what we've looked at today, Lord. Help us to walk worthy of that calling. Help us, Lord, to understand that we can pray to, to that end because that's your desire, that's your will, that we walk worthy of the calling that we have. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks, for being with us. We'll see you here, there, or in the air.